Over the past couple of years, I've recreated over a thousand sounds by making presets for the free Vital Synthesizer. I recently stopped taking commissions to recreate sounds, so I decided to make a video about my process. In this video, I'll show you a 10-step process for recreating a sound that works really well for synthesized sounds. In my next video, I'll cover some acoustic modeling techniques that are useful for recreating acoustic sounds. If you don't yet understand the fundamentals of sound design, such as frequency, amplitude, phase, and the harmonic series, I highly recommend you check out my free sound design tutorial series on YouTube. To demonstrate this process, we're going to recreate this melody from 10 by Fred again. You can download this preset along with over a hundred others on my Patreon page for just $5. And you can also download preset packs, some of them free, from my Gumroad page. Links to those are in the video description. Step number one. Isolate the sound you want to recreate. By that, I mean finding a part of a recording where no other sounds are playing. If that doesn't exist, you can try removing the other sounds with AI. At the time of making this video, I think the best AI model for separating stems of music uh, is Gaudio. It's a free online application, but the downside is that sometimes you have to wait a while to get your stems. Another great alternative is Deezer's Spleeder. I have a Max for Live plugin for that, so I can just use that in my DAW. So in my session here, I have stems for this track. The AI separated out the bass, vocals, drums, and other. Now, other can include a lot, especially if there are multiple synths in the track. It's a lot easier for AI to recognize the other tracks because they vary in timbre a lot less than synthesizers. Like in this track, the AI included a synth bass with the melody synth that I'm trying to recreate, so I can just EQ it out a little, but I mostly just have to ignore it since it occupies some of the same frequency range as the melody synth. Step number two, match the tempo and transcribe the notes. In Ableton, you can tap in a tempo, so I'll play a bit of the recording in a separate application like YouTube or Spotify, and then tap in the tempo here. Then I'll adjust it a beat per minute here or there so that the audio lines up with the grid visually. It doesn't need to be exact. Then I'll figure out the notes of the sound I'm trying to recreate if the sound has any discernible notes. If you struggle with this, I have a video all about how to recognize chords and melodies. Step number three, make a fast AB comparison. So now that I have the reference track loaded in next to my recreation, I'm going to assign a key that will switch between the two tracks. In Ableton, you can right click a button and click Edit Key Map. Then over here, you can assign a key. I'm going to use R for the on and off buttons for both of these tracks. Now if I turn off one of them, I can toggle between the two by pressing R on my keyboard. Try to match the volume of the two tracks when doing the AB comparison. Doing this comparison goes a long way for recreating a sound. If you don't do this, you may think your sound is a lot closer to the original than it really is. I used to think Coke and Pepsi tasted the same until I tasted them back to back. Step number four, match the dynamics. Now let's match the dynamics of the original. This is one of the easiest parts, but it's often overlooked. While we're adjusting envelope one, which controls dynamics, we're ignoring the timbre of the sound. We only care about how the volume evolves throughout the sound. Is the attack immediate, or does it swell like this sound? How long does it take to decay, and how steep is that decay? Step number five. Now let's finally analyze the timbre of the sound. Of course, I do this by ear, but sometimes I use a spectrum analyzer. I'm using the free one provided by Voxengo called Span. I turn on high res mode, and now I get a clear picture of how the amplitude of specific frequencies evolve throughout the sound. Now I'm going to play a clip of the sound with several different notes, if possible, and try to notice any patterns. I'm looking for areas throughout the frequency spectrum that consistently have more or less amplitude. 
This is important because if we only look at one note, we won't know whether we're seeing a frequency pattern or a harmonic pattern. I'll show you what I mean by that later. Now let's take a snapshot of the first note and get an idea of what's in our sound. This sound is a little complicated since we're also seeing the bass synth. This is where knowing the harmonic series comes in handy, but don't worry if you don't know the harmonic series of every note. I'll show you a workaround. The note playing at the beginning is a B3, so I'm looking for harmonics of B3. If we don't know the harmonic series of B3, I can just create a new track, add vital, and keep it at the default, which is a raw saw wave. Now if I add span to this track, then play a B3, I can press hold and span, and now I have an image with the harmonic series for B3 that I can reference. If I hover over a harmonic, I can see its note name at the top here. So the first five harmonics are B3, B4, F sharp 5, B5, and D sharp 6. Let's see if we can find these harmonics in my sound. If I freeze the spectrum analyzer on the reference track, I can see B3, B4, F sharp 5, B5, and D sharp 6. I'm noticing that the first harmonic B3 and the third harmonic F sharp 5 are a bit louder relative to the other harmonics. Other than that, I'm noticing that the harmonics get quieter as you go up in frequency until it cuts off completely somewhere above the fifth harmonic, which is D sharp 5. Now that's all valuable information, but I can't start creating the tone of my synth just yet. I need more information. Is that pattern I found for B3 the same for other notes as well? I notice that the third harmonic is loud, but is the third harmonic always loud? Or is that frequency always loud and that harmonic just happened to line up with that frequency? Let's take a look at the second note, which happens to be the furthest note away in the phrase. It helps to look at notes that are in the extremes to notice whether they share the same patterns. When I look at the second note, I notice the same pattern. This note is an A4. The first harmonic and the third harmonic, E6, is louder than expected. Then the harmonics die off above the fifth harmonic. I'll explain what we do with this information next. Step number six, choose a sound source. Since I noticed that the sound wasn't missing any harmonics and had several harmonics, I can use a saw wave since a saw wave has every harmonic. Then I can adjust the volume of those harmonics to match the reference. Step number seven, add or subtract amplitude from specific frequencies. Since I noticed that the harmonics tapered off in the upper register and disappeared after about the eighth harmonic or so, let's make that happen with a low pass filter. The drop off was steep, so I'm going to use the 24 decibel version. Since the sound cut off at about the 8th harmonic, I'm going to turn the key tracking up to 100%. If I notice that the sound cut off at the same frequency, regardless of what note was being played, I wouldn't use key tracking. For example, if the sound cut off at 3000 Hz for both the lowest note and the highest note, I would set the filter so that it cuts off anything above that specific frequency. Since that's not the case, I set the filter cutoff to depend on whatever note I play. Recall that we noticed that the first and third harmonics were particularly loud. Since that's consistent from note to note, we can simply go into the wavetable editor and raise the volume of those harmonics. If we notice that a certain frequency was always loud, regardless of what note was being played, we would have to use a filter resonance without any key tracking or an EQ band that stays in one place.
remember to match the volume of both for easier comparison. Now our tone is a lot closer to the original. We can dial it in more by comparing my version with the original in a spectrum analyzer. Step number eight, add any frequency modulations. I'm noticing a slow vibrato for each note. It's subtle, but on every note you can hear it move up and down in pitch. Let's do that with an LFO set to a sine wave shape. Let's set this to modulate fine pitch of our oscillator, then dial in the amount and then the rate. Step number nine, stereo effects. To check if the original sound has any differences between the left and right channel, I like to use another one of Voxango's free plugins, MSED. With this, you can mute the mid and only listen to the sides. If the sound is mono, you won't hear anything. Sometimes the sound is mono, but it has reverb that's in stereo, so you'll just hear the sides of the reverb. If you notice that the sound is in stereo, determine how you're going to add the stereo width. Usually it's using unison detune, chorus, phaser, flanger, or a short delay. To me it sounds like this sound might have a subtle chorus effect. Step number 10, add depth. This is where I'd add a delay or reverb. This can be hard to dial in if you're not able to hear the release of a note. I think I'm hearing a delay, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm also hearing a bit of reverb and the reverb sounds dense to me. To get a dense reverb, I can turn down the size. It also sounds a bit longer than one second. And that's it. A lot of times I'll go back to previous steps as I get closer to matching the original sound. For example, now that I have reverb and delay, I might notice that the note length is a little bit off.
So this is one approach to recreating a sound. Another approach to recreating a sound is trying to emulate the method used to create that sound. We already did this a little. The fret again melody was most likely made with subtractive synthesis, and that's how we made our version as well. But what about a sound made acoustically? For that, we can use physical modeling. Physical modeling attempts to replicate the laws of physics that govern sound production. Sometimes, especially for acoustic sounds, it's easier to emulate the physical process for creating the sound rather than trying to match the exact tonal characteristics like we did for the synthesized sound. In my next video, I'm going to go over some physical modeling techniques using Vital and my new favorite free plugin, the Spectral Compressor. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you for watching.